up there making faces at me and I can't operate, you know what I mean? <laughs> the Holy Spirit, rather, the Holy Spirit himself, he has a desire for you and me. And that desire is to reveal to us the deep secrets of God, the Bible said. As a matter of fact, the Holy Spirit, the Bible said we read last week, he wants to, he wants to show us the thoughts of God. He wants us not to know more than just the person of God, but the personality of God. He wants to show us who God is and how much he loves us and what he longs to do in our life. And last week we closed with this, that, that you and me have been given everything we need for life and godliness. Everything. You know what I mean? So there's no way that I can say that I'm stuck at this level I'm at because of my inability, because Peter said that I've been given everything I need to go to the next level. And so last week we closed with the fact that the only thing keeping me from seeing what God wants me to see is my willingness to see it. The only thing that could possibly keep me from the Holy Spirit transforming me into the next level is me. And so today that's where we're going to pick up. I want you to look with me, <coughs> excuse me, in Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to start with verse 13. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 it says, <coughs> And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, having believed you were marked with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is the deposited guarantee, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to praise be the glory. He said, you, when you heard God's word, when you heard the word of truth, now everybody here, if you're saved, you remember the time, now you heard the word of truth your whole life. But you remember the time that you heard the word of the truth and that little light bulb went on in your head. All of a sudden you realize, hey, he's talking to me. I got to do something here. When you heard the word of truth and you believed and acted on it. Now, my whole life I was raised in church. Maybe somebody else here, you might understand what I'm talking about. I was in church my whole life. I knew the gospel message. I could tell you how to get saved. And I thought I was saved. Until a little later on, God revealed to me that I didn't do anything but say a bunch of empty words. And then all of a sudden, I was in a weird predicament in my life. I could tell everybody else how to get saved, but I didn't know how to get saved. I wanted to, but I couldn't. I just could not figure out how I was supposed to submit. And then all of a sudden, one night, the Holy Spirit worked in a, in a powerful way in our house. And me and my wife, both in a state of desperation, we were both saved that night. And I remember that night, I, I still didn't know how to get saved, but I was sick of waiting. And so I just said, Lord, here I am. I knew I had to do something, you know what I mean? It wasn't any different than it ever was. It wasn't like that some kind of divine intervention come in the room and all of a sudden I could understand something I couldn't understand five minutes ago. I knew the plan of salvation. It was my willingness to get out of the way that was the problem. And all of a sudden I said, God, here it is, you do it. And, and, and the Bible says at that moment in our life, that when we, when we believe the message, when we accept the message, that we have, when we have heard the message of truth and believe, we're changed. We go on to a, a life of, we go on to a confession, a public confession, a baptism, a life of good works. We've, we've got this gift called the Holy Spirit. It's a deposited guarantee of eternal life. You know what that means? If the Holy Spirit lives in you, you're going. It's a deposited guarantee. And then... What? Think about that. And then what? Here's Paul, and, he, and that's his message. He said, you've got the Holy Spirit. Now listen to what he says in verse 15. We're going to read 15 on. For this reason, ever since I've heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for the saints, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you may know him better. And I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which you were he has called you. The glorious inheritance, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for those who believe. The power is like the working of his mighty strength which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead at the, and, and seated him in his right hand in heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, every title that can be given, 
not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. Paul is writing to this church in Ephesus, and he said, I have heard about your confession. I have heard about your conversion. I have heard that you got saved. And ever since I have heard that you let Christ in your life, I've given thanks for you every minute since then. I am so thankful that you let Christ work in your life. That's what he said. I haven't stopped giving thanks that you as a Christian let Christ work in your life, but I also haven't stopped giving thanks not only have I been praying for thank and thanking God, but I have been asking God that he would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Now you understand, they already had the Holy Spirit. So God's not asking them to get the Holy Spirit. He's asking them to give them revelation and wisdom through this Holy Spirit. You ever had something that you really didn't know you know how to get... You didn't even know how to use it. I'll tell you a funny example. I was thinking of this this morning. You know, oftentimes we got something and we don't even realize how ignorant we are of it. I, I bought a new tractor. Me and my dad bought a new tractor. We, we had it a whole year and put 800 machine hours on it. And, and at the end of the year, the guy was there about it and I, and I told him, that tractor has the worst seat I've ever seen in my life. He said, what are you talking about? That's a nice seat. I said, it is not. That's the roughest riding thing i ever seen. It has absolutely no spring value about it. So he walks over there and looks in there and says, well, there ain't no wonder. So what do you mean there ain't no wonder? He said, you still got it in the transport position, man. You've got to know how to use the seat. So he gets up in there and he puts pressure on the springs. And all of a sudden, man, it was like riding on a cloud. It's like, you know what, this ain't bad. 800 hours for a whole year we sat on top of the transmission. You know what I mean? <laughs> the reality is we had it. We just had no idea how to use it. I say that to shame myself, but that's the truth. And there's a world filled with Christians that have the Holy Spirit. But they have no idea how to use it. You know what I mean? They're saying this Holy Spirit thing, I don't know if it's what it's cracked up to be or not, but the Holy Spirit's the power of God. Paul said, I just pray that He can give you wisdom and revelation through that Spirit. For what? Well, listen to what he says. I pray that He may enlighten the eyes of your heart. Now think about that for a minute. I pray that through wisdom and revelation he may open the eyes of your heart. I love that. In 2 Peter 1.9, we talked about this at the radio station the other night if you were there. He talks about adding fruit to your faith. Add to your faith goodness and to your goodness knowledge and to your knowledge self-control. You know that verse. Add to your faith. And he says, if you do this, if you have these things, you will never be unproductive and ineffective in the work of God. Right? Then 2 Peter 1, 9, look what, but whoever does not have them, whoever does not add fruit to their faith is nearsighted and blind, forgetting they've been cleansed from their past sins. I love that because that word, nearsighted and blind, is the Greek word mupazo. Now the word mupazo is a neat word. Because you understand you can't be blind and nearsighted at the same time, right? You either got to be blind or nearsighted. But you can't be, if you're nearsighted, you ain't blind. And if you're blind, you're worse than nearsighted. So what he's saying is not really that you're nearsighted and blind. The word mupazo, it means nearsighted and blind. But what it means is one who has closed his eyes. Now, if you squint your eyes real tight, you know, you, go down, you can still see, but you, all you see is shapes. You know what I mean? All of a sudden, you get your eyes down there. Everybody don't look right no more. What Peter's trying to say is the person who hasn't added anything to their faith, the person who hasn't got the fruit of the Holy Spirit in their life has shut their spiritual eyes. They're not seeing what God wants to do in their life. The person who hasn't added the fruit of the Holy Spirit to their faith has spiritual eyes that are shut. But the closing of their spiritual eyes is their own doing. 
Peter, Paul says, I pray that God through wisdom and revelation may open the eyes of your heart and he wants to show you three things. Now listen to those three things. First of all, that you may know the hope to which you're called. I love this right here. Why in the world did God save you? I mean, what is his plan? He's an all-knowing, almighty, magnificent God, right? Right? And he had a plan even before Adam come into existence. He had an eternal plan that would last forever. What is his plan? You see, I think a lot of people think that salvation is just a get out of hell for free card. You remember in Monopoly, you get that get out of jail for free card? And a lot of people think Jesus went to the cross just to get out of hell for free. But I want to tell you something. Jesus went to the cross for a whole lot more than just to get out of hell. He wanted to transform you back into the height in which you fell. I want you to think about that for a minute. Jesus wanted to take you back to the height from in which you fell. Look with me at Romans chapter 8, verse 29 for a minute. When you get to Romans chapter 8, just keep your thumb there because we're going to be going back and forth. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of His Son. Think about that for a minute. Listen to this. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of His Son. Now God is an all-knowing God. I want to borrow your mind for a minute. God knew everything before it happened. God knows what you're about to say before you say it. He knew what you was going to look like before you was born. As a matter of fact, He knowed how many people was going to get saved before He created Adam. You believe that? Amen? He's an all-knowing God. But because He knew doesn't mean that He controlled all of it. Because you're a free choice being. He knows what you're going to do before you do it, but you've got to make the decision. You understand? And so God predestined everybody that would be saved, everybody that would believe that Jesus was the Son of God, He predestined them to go to heaven. I've explained this before. If I buy you a plane ticket to go to Florida, I have predestined you to go to Florida. If you have not enough sense to get on the plane, it's not my fault. You know what I mean? I say, here's your ticket. There's the plane. Florida's over there. You know? Jesus said, heaven's up there. I'm your ticket. Get on the plane. You know what I mean? The reality is he predestined me to go to heaven, but he just didn't predestine me to go to heaven. Everybody, every whosoever he knew would believe in him, he predestined to be conformed to the likeness of Christ. He just didn't want to get my sin wiped away. He wanted to make me look like Jesus Christ. He wanted to make me look like the Son of God. He wanted to transform me, me, into Christ likeness. The hope to which I was called is to be more than forgiven, but to be Christ like. The Bible says you have taken off the old self, which is corrupt, and putting on the new self, this is Colossians 3.10, who has been made new in the knowledge and the image of its creator. I'm being made new in the image of Jesus. I'm made to look like Christ. The hope to which I've called isn't just out of this world, but it's in this world. I'm going to be made like Christ. But the Bible goes farther than that. It says that I am an heir of God and a co-heir with Christ. Romans 8, 17. Listen to Romans 8, 17. I'm going to read it to you. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in His suffering in order that we may also share in His glory. Now, you wrap your mind around that for a minute. Jesus didn't just die to get me out of hell. He died to make me look like Him. But he just didn't die to make me look like him. He died so that I may share in his eternal glory. I am going to reign and you are going to reign with Christ. I own a piece of heaven. Heaven is as much mine as it is Jesus. It's as much yours as it is Jesus. It's because I'm a co-heir with Christ and I'm going to share in his eternal glory. 
Now I know that's hard to understand, but I read it to you. Some people say when their grandma died, God must have needed another angel, and so he called grandma home and gave her wings. Grandma would be getting demoted. The angels are going to be your servant when you get to heaven. You'll judge the angels. You're going to reign with Christ and share in his glory. You are the greatest of all creation. You. Not only that, but I'm going to be restored everything to which I was taken from. In the Garden of Eden, I seen Adam sin. God kicked him out. You remember that. He said, let's get him out of here lest he eat from the tree of life. Because if Adam had ate from the tree of life in a sinful state, he would have been forever in a sinful state. You get that? The tree of life, and however state you are when you eat of the tree, you're forever in that state. Adam was in a sinful state, so if he'd ate from the tree, he would have been forever banned from God. And so God said, get him out. Not because he wanted to punish Adam. He wasn't behind him going, get out of know, He said, get him out. Lest he eat of the tree. Jesus went to the cross and died. And when I accept him as my Lord, I'll be forgiven. And Revelation says in, first, in chapter 21, He who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life. I'm going back, back to the tree. I'm forgiven, and when I get to heaven, I'll be deemed perfect, and I'll eat of the tree, and I'll be forever in a perfect state. You understand, God's redemptive plan is to make me in the likeness of His Son. When He looks at me, He sees Jesus Christ. That's the glory to which I was called, is to be made like Christ. This ain't just about getting out of hell. This is about taking on the image of Christ. Paul says, I hope your minds are open to the fact that this ain't just some passive idea God had. But he's redeeming you and restoring you to Christ likeness. Not only that. But listen to what. You got to understand. You got to listen to the word in there in Ephesians chapter 1. This here is Tricky. Not only that, but the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints. Whose inheritance are we talking about here? God's inheritance. His inheritance. Not your inheritance. You're going to inherit heaven. But what's He going to inherit? He said it. It starts with an S. It ends with an S and it got an ain't in the middle. You know what I mean? His glorious inheritance in the saints, he's getting you. I'm going to inherit heaven. God's glory is to inherit me. Now you're looking at me like, man, I ain't much to get and I just don't understand this. Let me ask you something. When God created all things, everything, he gave dominion to who? Adam. But Adam. Adam was the only thing Adam didn't have dominion over. God had dominion over Adam. God give Adam dominion over all created things. When Jesus went to the cross, who did he die for? Humanity. People said, save the trees. They're going to burn, baby. Don't pollute the earth. Well, I'm all about saving the earth. But when he comes back, this baby's going down. Even the elements will be destroyed. He didn't die to save the grass. He didn't die to save the trees. He didn't die to save the ozone layer. He died for you. You are what he wants. You are what he's coming for. You are what he's died for. And you are the only thing he desires out of all of this. His inheritance is you. I don't know about you, but when the Holy Spirit starts opening my mind to the fact that the only thing God wants out of all this is my love, it makes me feel about this tall for what I have done to him. When you start realizing, when the Holy Spirit starts opening your eyes to how much God values a sinner you start realizing how pathetic your decisions of glorifying yourself rather than this God who loved you that much are. Paul says, I pray that you may understand the hope to which he called you, but I also pray that you may understand how much you mean to him. Because you're getting heaven, and all he wants is you. That's all he wants. From time of beginning of time till now, he has courted your and my heart. 
He sent his son to die for you. He's got the Holy Spirit at work right now in this room knocking on the doors of hearts. And the only thing he wants is you. That's all he wants. He said, I pray that you may understand the glory to which you're called. I pray that he may open your eyes to his inheritance in the saints, to how much you mean to him. And I pray that he may open your eyes to the power of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in which is at work in you. Man, that has a hard time wrapping around my mind. I keep kind of, you know, Romans 8, 11 says that the power who live, who die, I think they're going to put it up there. Romans 8, 11 says that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is alive inside of me. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, you will be raised. He who raised Christ from the dead who will raise you from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives and you, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is alive in me. So what does that mean? Well, listen to what Paul said there in Ephesians. He's given him authority. The power that raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand and, get, and far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, every title that can be given not only in the present age but also in the one to come. The power that raised Jesus from the dead gave him authority over all things. Right? Nod your head like this. If you, even if you're asleep, so I think I feel good about it. No. He has power over all things. Everything is under his feet. I want to ask you something. How does a sinner become a saint? You ever think about that? How does the power of addiction get overcome how does the power of hate get overcome how does the power of anger how does the power of lust how's the power of greed maybe the rest of you come on in this world all cleaned up but i want to tell you about me i've had lust in my life in ways you wouldn't even begin to understand i could write you books on it it plagued me all day and all night how in the world do you put that behind you well i can tell you one thing it ain't my physical strength I was at one of the lowest points I've ever been in my Christian life. I had laid awake at night. I had been disgusted. I had failed. I had failed miserably. I prayed. I prayed. I prayed. I didn't know what to do. There was a guy here. His name's Alan. He come here. He was a Gideon. After church was over, everybody cleared out. He waited on me. He said, I need to talk to you. I got a message and God told me to tell you. And I don't even know you, but I'm going to tell you. I said, shoot, man, because if there's ever a message I need, it's one from God. He said, God says for you to stop trying to win physical, uh, spiritual battles with physical strength. That day I said, man, that's big. I have no idea what it means, but that's big. And the more I've thought about it, the less I understood it. And, but you know what? The message is right there. The power who lives inside of me gave me dominion over every demonic evil force in this world. You know, the sin that's in your life didn't accidentally get there. Satan is real busy and he's got a lot of help. Right? Addiction is not accidental. That's Satan's plan. Lust, anger, hate, greed, malice, all those things, they are the desires of the flesh. But you know who wages war against the flesh? Satan. Ephesians chapter 6, they don't have this up there, but Ephesians chapter 6 says, Your battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and powers and principalities of this dark world against spiritual forces of evil and heavenly realms. You heard that, right? When Jesus died, the Holy Spirit gave him dominion over every single one of them. I just read it to you. When he rose from the dead, he has dominion over every power in this world. You remember that verse, he that lives in me is greater than he that's in the world? That's what they're talking about right there. Addiction's strong. But he that lives in me is greater than he that's in the world. My battle's not against addiction. My battle's against Satan, and I can't win, but the Holy Spirit can. He has empowered me to overcome sin. He has empowered me to live a new life. I have been empowered to put the past in the past and have a new future. I tried so hard to can change myself. I'm, I'm talking about my failure. I tried so hard to transform myself, but I can't do it. And I heard those testimonies about people that came back from the flames, man. 
people that were so close to hell they could feel the heat, you know what I mean? And God come into their life and he transformed them. How does that happen? Holy Spirit power. That's how it happens. He gives you power over your sin, power over your weakness, power over the things you don't even know how to overcome. He said, I pray that God enlightens you, that he opens the eyes of your mind, that you can understand that the Holy Spirit has empowered you to come over whatever's holding you back. If you're here today and addiction's your deal, the Holy Spirit is stronger than your addiction. If you're here today and there's sexual sin active in your life and you've got all kinds of lust and you don't know what to do with it, the Holy Spirit is stronger than your lust. If you're here today and you're arboring hate in your life and you have no idea how to forgive the people that is just, just destroying you, this hate is killing you, the Holy Spirit is stronger than your hate. Maybe you're here today and you just got all kinds of greed. You've never been content with what you got and you've always wanted what everybody else wants and truly you're never ever satisfied you've never had peace in this life you just got you're just filled with all kinds of envy and greed and jealousy the holy spirit is stronger than what's holding you back paul says i pray that you may understand that he called you to a great hope that he loves you so much that he wants you more than anything in this world and he has empowered you to overcome he's empowered you to overcome I want you to plug this verse into your mind. I want you to remember, it's, it's Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, I think it's verse 6. Yeah, verse 6. I want you to put that in your mind. Listen to what that says. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to the completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Now I want you to say something with me. Everybody ready? Y'all awake? All right. I am a work in progress. That's exactly right. I am a work in progress. And it's God's job to finish me up. You get that figured out. You'll have a whole lot behind you. I can't fix it. I just got to let him. You know that verse in the Bible that says, be still and know that I am God? I always kind of had that translated long. I thought it meant sit down and do nothing. You know what I mean? And if you're honest today, I think most Christians have translated it the same way. Be still and know that I am God. So I've been still watching and waiting for him to fix it. No, no, he said, your willingness to let me fix it is paramount. I pray that the Holy Spirit opens your eyes. This is my prayer for you. That the Holy Spirit opens your eyes to the fact that God wants to take you farther than you've ever been before. That he loves you more than you ever knew. And that he's empowered you to do everything he'll ever call you to do. Paul says in Corinthians chapter 12, the Holy Spirit empowers us to do all kinds of things. He said he gives some to be apostles and some to be prophets and some to be teachers and some to be leaders and some to be givers and some to have gifts of speaking in tongues and some to have gifts of interpretation. But he says in verse 31, eagerly desire the greater gifts. I had a hard time figuring out what that means, desire the greater gifts. I thought the Holy Spirit just went around and said, you apostle, you teacher, you prophet. No. You got to desire the gift the Holy Spirit will show you and empower you to do what you're willing to see and be empowered to do the Holy Spirit is not going to empower somebody who has no desire to be empowered it's there but they don't know how to use it it's there the Holy Spirit lives inside you it's there but until you desire the greater gifts, until you desire freedom from whatever it is that changed you, you're not going to have it. The power's there. Paul said, I pray God opens your eyes to know how to use it. I pray he opens your eyes to know how to use it. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, salvation is at your fingertips. All you got to do is be willing and you can be saved right now. Right now. You don't have to wait the next week. You don't have to wait the next month. You don't have to wait five more minutes. We're getting ready to have the invitation hymn. You can accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior before I say the next word. But I want to tell you something. Don't lie to yourself. 
To accept Jesus as Lord is to leave your old life behind. To publicly confess him as Lord is to get out of your comfort zone. And so I'm asking you, if you're willing to accept Jesus as Lord, what in the world's keeping you in your seat? Move. He's done it all for you. Move. And if you know Jesus Christ as Lord and you kind of stopped at the starting line, you know what I mean? One time in gym class, Miss Rita Dirt, she made us run the mile. And me and Chad Gilvin sat down and took a break. It took us 20 minutes to run the mile. Took out all them rest of them suckers. They was sweating. They had sweat running all over them. We was saying, man, them people right there, they're dumb. You know what I mean? There's a perfectly good bench halfway around. You know, we thought we was the geniuses. The next day, she said, we're going out to the track again. We got out to the track. She said, okay, everybody sit down and watch Chad and Derek. They're going to run the mile because they took 20 minutes yesterday. Yeah. We stopped at the starting line. That didn't suit her at all. You know what I mean? The reality behind it is God is not satisfied with you sitting at the starting line because he's empowered you to run the race in such a way as to win. If you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you ain't letting the Holy Spirit do what he wants to do, I'm asking you today, rededicate your life. Ask God to open your eyes. If you're here today and you're lukewarm, ask God to light your fire because he is whatever you need. Won't you come as we sang our invitation hymn? All right. There you go. You want to go up there, Mama? We better wait till Mama gets there. I forgot she had the camera. And if I put her in there like that, she ain't going to be heavy at all. Michael, would you raise your right hand, please? Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Yes. And do you surrender to Him to be the Lord of your life? Yes. Upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You ready? Yeah. All right, cover your nose. And, all right, here we go. All right. You all right? He's right on up there. Mama, let me get you. It's right there on this side, Chrissy. You gotta. There you go. If you guys would uh, bow with me, I want to close this. Father God, we're so happy to be in your house today. And God, I just thank you for the confidence in Michael, uh, Micah's eyes, Lord, whenever he looks at you with the utmost of belief, Lord, that you are who you say you are. Father God, I just ask you to be with this little guy, Lord, and all those who've made a profession of faith, Lord. And I, I, like Paul, prayed for the Ephesian Christians, Father. I just pray, Father God, that you just keep opening the eyes of his little heart, Lord. I pray you open the eyes of all our hearts, God. I just pray you give us wisdom and revelation that's far beyond our own. Father God, I just thank you so much for the, what we've got to see here, and I thank you for the Holy Spirit's movement, and I just ask you to bless Micah and and Lord, in his walk with you, and I ask you to bless all those so many who step forward and make commitments. And Lord, I just pray as a church that we don't leave them sitting on the side of the baptistry, Lord, but we teach them and we just cheer them on and we always be encouragers and never discouragers. And I pray for somebody in this room today, God, who maybe didn't make a decision they needed to make and they've kind of quenched the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I just pray that you don't give up on them and I pray you keep pounding on the door of their heart that they cannot leave 
this place, Lord, without talking to somebody. And if they do, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you keep until they do talk to somebody, Father God. I thank you for the power you give us to live a new life. And I just ask you to go with us where we go till we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. Miss Annie, I forgot to ask.